Bill will join us in just a couple of seconds here. In studio with the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield, free of yellow jackets over the weekend. Good morning, Rob. I uh, thought Rick did a very eloquent job of uh, defending the university, as well as it should have been Board of Governors. And New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, who's working on a deadline here this week. I am working on a deadline. Yeah. Actually, I'm heading out to the library after this to hold myself up in a quiet place. What uh, is uh, your drop-dead date there? Uh, October 15th. Oh, you got plenty of time. I know. Have you started yet? <laughs> <laughs> He's still looking for an idea, Bill. Yeah, yeah. I'm about 12, 13 pages into it now. Yeah, so Rob and I can provide the ideas. Oh, you do. Yeah. <laughs> you do. <laughs> you don't know it, but you do. <laughs> uh, but let me ask you this. Is it possible for you to work anywhere into your next book the phrase, Never lick a gift horse in the mouth. Can you? Could Here you, we go. <laughs> <laughs> could, can you work that into your book? Actually, I, better than that, because you want to show, not tell. I can have my heroes wander up on someone who is, in fact, <laughs> a horse licking <laughs> the horse in the mouth. And I think that's I think that's illegal in many states. <laughs> I think to to make out with your horse should be against the law. I think. As, as long as it's over 12 years old, right? <laughs> you know, but as long as you know your finances, you can get away with anything. Right? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe, Bill. Maybe. <laughs> Bill, there's your intro, buddy. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I'm never going to live that one down, I fear, I'm afraid. Probably not. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. Hey. Especially when it becomes memorialized in <laughs> Bill Strap's book. And what's yeah, really the, nice the world will know. It's an evergreen open. <laughs> it is. You know, it can, it, it can always fit in any it's not, day. It's not, as it's a surprise. Time, stamp, time stamp on it there. Phil, how about those Steelers? I'm telling you, and I almost got my 19 to 16 right, but two, two and one, and which isn't a shock given who they've played so far this season. And they haven't played well, so they, I think that's a good thing. You know, even last night, the offense looked a lot better. I think I bragged a little bit, said, hey, the offense is, they've had a couple of drives, they look better, ran the ball a little bit better, man, defense is, is opportunistic. I'd say nasty because people move the ball up and down the field on them, but they're getting turnovers and sacks and splash plays, and somehow I'm happy. You know, two, two and one, and they've got Houston next week. And then the the terrible Ravens, and that that will be a huge one. So I'm so far, you know, I'm I can't say that on an individual game basis. I thought, wow, look at those guys go. But when you step back and look, and they're tied for the lead in division, I think they would have the tiebreaker. They're really early in the season. But having said that, they haven't played well. They've had some injuries, and they're two and one. So and, you know, uh, I'm not going to lick a gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> nor should you. Nor should anybody. You know, it, it, it's a good weekend when the Steelers win and the Cowboys and Ravens lose. <laughs> it just makes the weekend so much well, better. Well, you know, from my from my standpoint, I was happy to see. No, I don't have a feeling either way with the Cowboys, but the uh, the Ravens, I wanted to see them lose only because they're in the conference. But even better, man, the Washington football team, they were going to go 17 and 0 win the Super Bowl with Sam Howell and. And, you know, so I'm glad to kind of see them come back down to earth a little bit. They got stomped, man. Yeah, they did not just come down to the earth. They collided to the earth. They, uh, they... Wasn't as bad as the Broncos, though. Cause you feel, I feel bad for Bronco fans. My goodness. The Broncos had the South Charleston treatment this weekend. Apparently, a lot of kids from uh, different high schools transferred into the Miami Dolphins uh, this week. <laughs> and yeah. uh, there are delegates all around the state that are up in arms over that score. <laughs> Yeah, I saw the, another South Charleston score. I thought, oh, God, those poor kids. Yeah. It was, woo. I saw that score flash across 70 to 20, and I thought, is that some kind of joke? <laughs> Who in the NFL scores 70 points anymore? That's, that's insane. And, and I think they shut it down. I think they had 70 points with eight minutes to go in the fourth quarter. That's uh, not normal, right? So I guess the last time it was done was 1966, they said, when uh, I think Washington beat New York Giants 71-42 or something like that, if I remember. Yeah. Uh, Phil, let's talk, uh, let's talk money because the uh, quarter is going to end uh, this week with this being September the 25th, last uh, week of the third quarter of the year fiscally. And uh, you give us a, an up-to-date a market report here or markets uh, for the year, positive, negative, or could go either way. For the year, it's, it's still been a, it's still been a good year, and you go from the b very beginning of the year and even back to October of last year. So we go for a rolling one year. It's been a, it's still been a good period. August and September, we saved some of August toward the end, but September has been has been bad. And I don't know that there's there's really any saving. It would take a miracle 
uh, to pull out a positive September, but it still has. You have to look at it in perspective. It still has been a pretty good year. We've given back some of what we have made. We had overestimated, I think, the dot plot and what the Federal Reserve and when the Federal Reserve would do it. But it's still data dependent. You know, I just I think we read too much sometimes into what the Federal Reserve says. It's based off of the data that we're getting. And quite frankly, on the employment front, the data is too good right now to make us think that the uh, Federal Reserve would begin to cut rates uh, sooner rather than later. The big debate right now for the rest of the year is will there be another rate increase? That's the question in my mind. It's a short term, but for the fourth quarter, will there be another rate increase? But it, that has been, you know, Jackson Hole heard again when he reiterated the 2% target uh, that he, they weren't coming off of that. So that, that hurt a little bit, and we regained some of it. And, and then some of the CPI and PPI. Now, this week we get PCE numbers, and the Federal Reserve says that's what their their preferred measure is, the PCE number. And, but we kind of already know what that is, and any damage that would be done would have been done by the CPI and the PPI, all these inflation readings that mean so much right now. But And consumer confidence comes out this week as well. There are some earnings, uh, Costco and Nike are, are earnings, but I don't know that there's any earnings that would be uh, on an individual basis that are, none of them are big enough to move our entire market. So I'm just looking for something positive going into October and hopefully it, it ignites another run like we've had, even with this bad month and, and bad August, or down August anyway, that uh, uh, October could ignite what we saw last year and go into the fourth quarter strong. Government shutdown, Phil. Markets care one way or the other? You know, I think, you know, and in, in, I'm, I'm going back and forth, you know, on a fundamental basis, no, and not really. And But, you know, you have to I have to remember what my dad used to tell me all the time, which, which was perception is reality, especially in the moment. And our perception is, is that it does matter. But there's two ways of looking at it. You know, the perception, it makes consumers afraid. And if it damages consumer confidence, then maybe it will be a – a help us with inflation a little bit, you know. So there's two ways to look at it. So can it, will it, will it hurt us? Possibly because re- perception is reality, especially in the moment. But uh, you know, we, we've our stance has always been that you know, even if there were a government shutdown, that it, and there, I think there's a better chance this time than last. But if even if there were, it would it wouldn't be very long standing. No one wants to take the blame for that, and then all would be repaired after it ends. Financial Phil McCoy, our guest here on the program. Billy. Yeah, uh, good morning, Phil. Uh, there have been other pressures on the market for the last uh, last several months, uh, and the question is what do these kind of like the sh- gun, government shutdown that have any impact at all? The pressures I'm talking about is certainly the UAW strike. Uh, will it expand? There's a possibility it will. Uh, but in addition to that, we've had some severe weather in, in throughout the country at various times, which has uh, affected the insurance insurance in, in Florida, uh, affected some supply chains throughout the rest of the country. These things in net, have they had any influence on, on the market? To, to this point, not really. You know, and it could be a short term, and we'll, we'll talk about the storms and so forth first. On one hand, where it could bring down some insurance because of all those major catastrophes. Now, a lot of those insurance companies that they have a, uh, a catastrophe sort of clause. You know, if you, you can't say, well, hey, you took out an entire city and then the insurance be responsible for it, that's where FEMA and those guys kind of step in and help out a little bit. But the UAW strike is gathering so much attention, and I think it gets a lot of attention because it is the big three. It's the American uh, automakers, and it incites some type of emotional response, whether you're for or against. It doesn't really matter. It's, it, it incites some type of response. And it could hurt consumer confidence on the auto front. Now, I didn't used to think that the the automobile industry could have such a huge impact on inflation until last year. I was proven wrong. Uh, But last year, that was a huge part of the cost of these cars was a huge, huge part of our inflation problems that we're dealing with. And we're still coming out of of all this. But what I ultimately think with the United Auto Workers is that whenever a deal is struck at the end of the day for those three, it's going to cost the companies more money, and I do think it would have some sort of impact on an individual basis. But the question is on the overall economy or the stock market, 
And quite frankly, this is kind of a sad statement, but I don't know that those three have the same power or leverage that they used to have on the overall economy because of the Hondas and Toyotas and the Teslas and everything else that uh, that our consumers have a choice and are willing to purchase at a comparable or maybe sometimes a better price. So I don't know that they can kind of shut down or impact the overall auto market as much as they used to, maybe in pickup trucks, because those guys are the, are the clear leaders in pickup trucks. But uh, but overall, I'm not, I, I don't think, and other than an individual basis and the companies that are supplying those materials to them, it could hurt them in the long run. But a wide-sweeping uh, market fall due to the UAW, I don't think it would. And it's kind of a sad statement, you know, because, of, well, I guess I don't know if it's sad because you've got other competition. It's also being made. There may not be American companies, but they're being made here. Uh, but you've got other competition that kind of slows them down. But in my mind, growing up in southern West Virginia, if you weren't driving a Ford, a Chevrolet, GMC, or a Jeep, or a Dodge, then, I mean, you, that's all you had. That's all you saw. That was it. And But now I don't know that that's really the case. So overall, I don't know that it would hurt, but on an individual basis, it could. It could have some sort of uh, impact on an individual. When I say individual basis, I mean those particular companies for GMC. And do you pronounce it Stellantis now? Is that how they pronounce that? What Chrysler changed their name to? Stellantis. More importantly, but, uh, Phil, you said Tesla properly. I did. I made, I made it a point. I made it a point. I got ridiculed for saying Tesla. So I, I acknowledge that it's Tesla. You have to mispronounce their name correctly. <laughs> Wrap your head around that. Mr. Gilstrap. I want to shift from the markets <clears throat> to the overall economy. I feel like there's a lot of gaslighting that's going on here. I hear that the economy is too strong. That's why we have to keep raising rates. When, in fact, it really doesn't feel that way. You can't get a mortgage it's for less than... Me you it can't get a mortgage for less than 7%. Cars are expensive. Everything's more expensive. Food is more expensive. And, and everything that's in the box is less. You know, there's less in there. What is the disconnect here? Why is it that what we're being told doesn't feel like what we feel? Because Jerome Powell has a war on the American economy. <laughs> <laughs> he keeps raising well, interest rates. Here's, I think, ultimately, and overall, and we, we say this with gas prices during the summers a lot, I think overall, those prices that you talk about, the, the shrinkflation at the grocery store and everything is more expensive and you can't buy a home, but ultimately the reports show us that we only care enough to complain about it as a whole, but we don't care enough to stop doing it. So we're still doing it. We're still traveling. We're still, to some extent, it's slowed down, but we're still buying homes. You're still People are still buying and, and selling homes, even though that has slowed down some, but it is still fairly healthy and the, the employment producing. And, you know, I, I always have to try to cushion this because I don't want it to sound like I want people to lose their jobs. I don't. But at the end of the day, a healthy employment market with higher wages is an inflationary pressure. So if you say, hey, consumers, and we'll see cons consumer confidence this week, it bleeds right into it. What feeds consumer confidence is what their paychecks look like. And in some cases, what their portfolios look like. And regardless of what the August and September has looked like, both of those are still strong and both of those are still, still good. So you have a complaining consumer, but still a willing consumer. And that's the disconnect. It doesn't feel strong to me either. You know, I'm out as as uh, not financial fill, or, and I'm, I'm just out buying groceries and I'm doing things. Or, heck, Ada bought a pair of sweatpants that used to, I remember, they used to be 28 bucks, and this kid has to buy the tall sweatpants. So there's this one brand that she, when they go to South Carolina or somewhere for a tournament, they have a store, and she always gets us for a pair of sweatpants. I remember the first time she did that, they were 29 bucks. It was $46. It was the same daggone sweatpants. She gets the same color because she always ruins them. But it was the same sweatpants, and it was 46 bucks. And that's just a, a you know she went to they went some one of my kids went to Target last night came back with a receipt for eighty bucks and I can't tell you what they got they got a T-shirt and some soap and whatever else girls get I don't know their flavored shampoo and stuff I don't but the but they got that stuff and it was eighty bucks and it just seemed insane to me but we still did it you know we didn't stop them uh, Phil and Beth didn't stop them from doing it or they didn't stop doing it or, and we just complained about it after the fact. And I think that's what the, that's where the point we are right now with consumers. It's not stopping us. We're just whining about it and still doing it. So are lower income people just not counted? Because people of, of 
whatever the means testing is, people who can afford it can afford it. But we're getting, I would think, to the tipping point where there's a good chunk of society well, that can't. And, well, and Phil, be, before you go, let me just throw this in that uh, recently I had heard that credit card uh, debt was at an all-time high in the country. So they're still spending the money they can't afford to spend. They're just charging it at exorbitantly high interest rates. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, which is another sign that the, the consumer will slow down soon. So we used to follow that, that consumer debt. And it was at one of its lowest point per capita. It was one of its lowest points at the end of 2020. And that was because we weren't using it. But that let us know that the consumer was going to come back hot and heavy and, and, and spend the money that they have. But, but back to your point about the lower income, that is the part of that wage inflation that we talk about. It just kind of flipped over to real wage inflation or to where you actually see it, where wage inflation was higher than overall inflation. So they're, they're getting more money. Now, you know, I can talk about my kids with entry-level positions, how much Ada can get at an entry-level position opposed to what Abigail, the older one, could get pre-COVID. It's night and day, the difference that those two get paid because of wage inflation. And they, although they're not necessarily low income because they're still, you know, they're still supported by their parents, but those are the types of jobs that we're talking about, entry and exit-level positions. And they're paying more, which is support at least to some extent, uh, supports them spending more. They may not be getting more, but they're spending more on these goods and services, and, and, and the, uh, the increase in wages support that. And that's why we say, look, those, those, those jobs numbers are really important, especially on how much wage inflation, because that supports consumer spending, which in, so supports inflation, and that's the battle we're trying to win. We've gotten almost there. You know, make no mistake about it. Inflation has come down. It's slowed, you know, the... The increase and decrease has slowed down, which is expected as you get closer to that target, which is why you and I both have talked about, man, I just kind of wish they'd come off of that target instead of it, it not being so drastic at 2%. And he reiterated in August that they're not going to do that. So we do. there's going to be a focus, a heavier focus on wages and employment numbers than what they were at the beginning of the year as we go into the fourth quarter and early next year. There will be a big focus on wages. Yeah. Phil, uh, when you answered John's first question, I came away thinking that Rob, instead of introducing you as financial Phil, he should introduce you as Dr. Phil. Because that was, that's already <laughs> trademark, Bill. That's a trademark, yeah. The, uh, uh, but again, I, I think uh, John's making some good points. We're seeing this more and more in the political realm. Uh, the president says that uh, the economy has improved a great deal, and he gives example after example after example. The flip side is the people are not feeling this. They're not resonating with it. Uh, do you see anything that can be done or will be done prior to the heart of the election system uh, season, which starts uh, early next year, that's going to drive the economy one way or the other? Yes, uh, cutting interest rates. And, you know, we follow that with the dot plot. So that tipping point that we talk about, which I fully agree. There, I mean, I think we are at a tipping point, and we will get where we go further than just complain about it. And that's when our credit cards are maxed. As a, as a society, our credit cards are maxed, or we're not going to buy that new home, or we're not going to buy that new car because the interest rates are too high. Companies aren't going to borrow money because of, to to expand because they've burnt through their cash. And we always talk about Apple with how much cash they had on hand. But when company it impacts companies as well, and then when we start to see that show through in a, in a weakening economy by how we measure it, and you know with uh, wage numbers and employment numbers and CPI and PPI and consumer confidence and all these numbers that blend in together, when we start to see those filter through those numbers, that's when the Federal Reserve will begin to talk about cutting interest rates, and then we'll be in a, another strange little area where we're saying, well, why is the market going up? when the economy is in such bad shape and then you'll you'll have you'll see a narrative change politically where they'll start talking about how the market's doing well instead of how good the economy's doing and right now you can say well the economy's doing great and then on the other side it's like yeah but the market stalled and that, that that narrative will just flip we have to remember that the markets trade in advance of the economy so they don't act in lockstep you know you don't have a faltering economy and stock market at the same time typically you typically have a stock market that starts to fall when the economy is at its peak and a stock market that starts to go up 
when the economy is at its trough. Look back to April of 2020 for evidence of that. As everyone is home because of the shutdown, then nobody is spending money, and our market soared on a daily basis, and it did so through the entirety of 2020. The economy wasn't in good shape then, not at all, and I didn't even see a light at the end of the tunnel. I wondered how long it would be, but along the way, our markets were forecasting that out. So we'll, we, we will see that, and I think it will come in the form of rate cuts or the beginning of rate cuts where they start to open the door or suggest that it could be around the corner. Speaking of rates, Phil, I'm researching online during our conversation that right now you can get anywhere from a six-month to a 12-month CD from anywhere from 54 to 5.5%. If you can get that kind of return on your money with no risk, real risk of losing it, why would you at this time put it into a volatile market instead? That's a beautiful question because it still doesn't keep pace with the rate of inflation overall. So when you look at the market you had asked earlier, and I'm going to click a button and tell you how much the S&P and NASDAQ is up so far this year. So if you would have done that earlier this year, you could have made that argument as well. The rates weren't as good, but you could have made that argument uh, earlier this year as well. But the S&P began the year at approximately uh, 3870, and it is now at 4345 future. So that that return is much much higher than what the uh, the return on cash would be. Now, if you know that there's an expense coming up, I've got to buy a car, I've got to pay tuition, um, I need to put a down payment on a home. That money shouldn't be invested. It shouldn't be invested whether you're getting a quarter of a percent return or five percent return. But it's a good parking place for it. But long-term investing to jump in and out based off of cash, you're still trailing inflation. You're not keeping up with the overall inflation with those short-term CDs. Look out further, and I, I do like to read these risk-free rate of return uh, to see what they look like in the future. Right now, I think what you'll find is that six months in a year are the highest rates, and you go out to uh, 18 months or 24 months or 36 months, and they start to come down. That's them telling you that, hey, I think rates are going to be cut and we don't want to get stuck in paying you 5.4% for three years because we know that rate's going to come down. So we'll pay it for you. And you remember, and this may, this may be able to go unsaid, but if you're getting a six-month CD at 5% or any type of risk-free rate, that is an annualized rate. So through the first six months, you're not getting 5%. You're getting 2.5%. And then it's going to renew or you do what you do from that point forward. But you can get that you know, the, those returns in the stock market been proven time and time again the only true way with, with your cash money anyway i'm not talking about real you know, purchase in real estate but the only true way to keep pace with inflation is equity exposure and dealing with these ups and downs and some of the the mental games that the markets can play with you phil you mentioned inflation before i let you go i want to pull the room here too so i just i learned this from reading uh in regards to a, the pirates game over the weekend in cincinnati they were down nine nothing and they actually came back and won 13 to 12 it's pretty insane but part of that from the writer i was following during the game was the price of a root beer float at the great america ballpark in cincinnati bill what what do you think the price of a root beer float is at the great american ballpark in cincinnati 17 dollars. john gilstrap 15 phil mccoy uh, 1350. The price of a root beer float in Cincinnati at the Great America Ballpark is $32. Holy mackerel. Is it like 64 ounces? <laughs> I don't care if it's the size of a swimming pool. $32. But that tells you that people are buying it, though. They, if nobody bought the root beer float at the last game, they would reduce that price. So that goes to a complaining consumer, but they're still spending their money on it. Somebody's buying those stupid root beer floats for. For thirty-two bucks, somebody's doing that. We need to find those people and sterilize them, them because you can't you can't spread that kind of stupid around for future generations. No, 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 no. root you, beer float. You can't do that. If you're if you're bucking up thirty-two for a root beer float, I don't want you having children. I'm just saying. You really want a root beer float if you spend thirty-two bucks on it? Phil, how do we reach you for more information today, sir? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and say this was an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have yourself a great day. Thank you, guys.